Hello and welcome to this episode of Five Alum Task Force. If you're watching on the video, we welcome you for the first time. If you're listening to the audio, welcome back. You already heard our intro and a little bit about my guest. And I'm happy to say that uh, my guest, returning guest, is also now a friend. And it is Dr. Gamaliel Baer. Uh, that's a doctor with an EDD at the end, not an MD. But uh, I'm not going to repeat his magnificent bio that he has. Uh, you can find that on our first uh, podcast with him, which was episode uh, five dash, I believe, five dash uh, 12. And um, that's both on the audio and on our YouTube channel at Five Alarm Task Force Corp. And the reason why I've had Gamaliel return, or we call him G, that's his nickname, G, returned, is because we were talking in our first uh, podcast with him about his dedication to and his external service to the fire service. Now, what am I talking about? Well, he is a volunteer firefighter. He's a volunteer firefighter in Howard County, Maryland, right? Career. Oh, career. Career volunteer with uh, Howard County, Maryland. Um, he is also a Coast Guard officer. But when he did his, when he wrote his dissertation, he really aimed it at the fire service looking at overall health and wellness and leadership and resilience and how do we build that up in the 21st century uh, many of us and many of you listening and i'm one of them had our careers in the 20th century and we all know that firefighting has changed the fire service has evolved uh, the old joke is you know the one thing that the two things the fire service likes the most the status quo and change uh, so now we're in the 21st century. We've learned a lot of lessons since my day back in the mid 70s when I started, and we're learning a lot more. But what we're going to talk about today is the concepts, the underpinnings of leadership and resilience in the fire service. And uh, G was very kind to share with me a piece of his dissertation on leadership. Um, and I was just amazed by his definitions, the, the uh, actually from an embryo concept, embryonic concept, I should say, and it grows and grows to really what we've been trying to talk about in the fire service for probably the last 10 years. We've seen different generations coming up and some of the established people say, ah, these kids don't know what they're doing. And others say, yeah, I've got to give them a chance. And the kids say, well, give me a chance. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have that opportunity before. But in the paperwork that he's provided to us and that I've read, the portion that I've read, it is so definitive of what we're looking for in leadership. And so, gee, let's start with this, that concept of how you – how you decided to go all the way back really to that embryonic stage. And it's almost like I talked, mentioned in, in the last podcast of what, when I wrote that paper on tending a garden and you plant a seed and you water it and you give it some sun, you make, and you wait, can't wait for that first bloom, that first little green sprout that pops up. And you're so excited because you created something out of a seed, but if you don't take care of it and tend it and make sure it stays healthy and vibrant, that plant is not going to grow. It's going to wither and be gone. And I think your definitions here, what I've read in this part of the dissertation on leadership, really takes us from that seed level, the embryonic stage, and to what we can look for to create leaders in the fire service today, if you please. Yeah, so um, happy to be back, Steve. Thank you for having me on again. Um, last time was a blast, and, um, and I'm grateful to be back on and and hopefully uh, your viewers are enjoying all your other podcasts and this one too. So uh, thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So um, I'm excited to talk about um, leadership and resilience uh, with you today. <clears throat> but I think it's important first that we circle back to where we left off last time and just re, uh, re-examine briefly what health and wellness was all about. And what we said was that um, health and wellness are two different things. Health is sort of our status as a human being, and wellness is how we got there. And actually, if you look up the definition of health in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, what it says is being of sound body, mind, and spirit. And that's 
important because when we're talking about resilience and leadership, we're implying how, that they mean something about humanity or humans. When resilience is also used in physics when we talk about the resilience of steel or other objects, but we're not talking about that today. We're talking about humans, so it's important for us to know what makes a human. And so we have to go back to that definition of health, and in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it says health is being of sound body, mind, and spirit, or soul, some people say, right? Those are the three dimensions of a human. Sure. Um, and so when we talk about resilience, then, if we agree that we're talking about the application on human beings, then conversation um, about how do you include the body, mind, and soul? That's what I like to say I, instead of spirit. So I'll, I'll use that word instead. Um, and, and here's why. Oftentimes when we talk about resilience, people say, oh, resilience is the ability to bounce back. And that's a common way to define resilience, but that's because we use that term from physics. Steel is resilient or an object is resilient if it bounces back, but that's not enough. As, as you would say, it's not the necessary and sufficient components for when we're talking about human resilience. And the reason is because if all you had to do is bounce back as a human, then that means um, you could get punched by somebody, stand back up, get punched again, stand back up, and just keep doing that same thing over and again. And we would say, oh, that person's resilient. But the problem is eventually that person would probably die of blunt force trauma, <laughs> you know, especially if the person who's punching is, is punching very hard. But that's not what we mean when we say resilient. Uh, there's another common term that's used uh, for resilience, and it's uh, this idea about having a reserve built in. And um, that's used also in non-human discussions on resilience, but also human uh, discussions. But like the military talks about having reserve components, right? If we have to upstaff for a surge deployment or having a computer system that has reserve capacity, those types of things are mentioned in the same more, um, you know, conversation about resilience. But having a reserve also is, is problematic if that's where we stop the definition, because what that means at the logical conclusion is humans are resilient if we have more of something. So if you have more money, more muscle, more fat deposits to overcome, you know, hibernation or something like that. And that leads you down the road of, well, if reserve means resilience, then resilience means having more of everything. And that also is problematic. And there's one last um, common definition, which I think helps to sort of round out the idea of resilience, which is the ability to overcome an obstacle. And in the military, there's a common phrase that is used, which is adapt and overcome to a challenge. And I think when you add those three components together, the ability to bounce back if, if something knocks you down, having reserves, and a lot of times those two things are connected. You can't necessarily bounce back if you don't have reserves in you uh, to, to accomplish something. But then importantly, overcoming the challenge. Because if you don't overcome the challenge, then we're stuck with the definition or at least the common definition of insanity, which is doing something over and over again the same way, but expecting a different result. And we don't mean to say that when we say someone's resilient. And so bringing that idea, those three components in to the idea of a human, then resilience is either bouncing back and having reserves, but then also importantly, overcoming a challenge in relation to the body, the mind, or the soul. And that gets us to the very beginning of the discussion is if that's what resilience is for humans, how do you increase that? And the way that I know how to increase uh, the resilience, the ability to overcome a challenge of the body, the mind, or the soul is to get yourself out of your comfort zone just a little bit in any one of those components. And that's how growth occurs. Growth can't occur if you're doing the same thing over and over again every single day. So if we want to be a little bit stronger with our, you know, squats or our bench presses, you have to increase the stress of those exercises a little bit. If you want to increase your mind, you have to take on a slightly harder challenge, whether it's a reading challenge or a problem solving challenge. Um, and if you want to increase your, the resilience of your soul, you have to be able to learn to love or forgive somebody or, or some issue 
that you haven't had to deal with before, even if it's just a little bit. And interestingly enough, as a, as a parent, anybody who's listening who's a parent probably realizes that that kind of happens automatically as your kids get older. You start to have to love and forgive them on bigger and bigger issues. And it sort of makes your heart grow almost, and you don't even have to, you know, intentionally do it. But the question then is, how do you do that when you're not dealing with your own kids or your own family? That becomes very hard. And a lot of times what we see is people purposely um, close themselves off to others that they disagree with. And then what happens is you're not faced with those challenges to have to love and forgive somebody that's not your child or your kin. So when we're talking about human resilience, we're really talking about growing the body, the mind, or the soul a little bit more than we had before. And if, and, and in doing that, we're able to bounce back. We're able to overcome a challenge. And so I, I think that sort of gets us into at least the foundational definition of what resilience is. You know, I, as you're talking, I probably, nothing to do with the paper or the work, but the word resilience. I was talking to my wife the other day uh, because, as you know, I was ill in November and part of December. And, um, and I've had, life has just thrown me a, a lot of surgical situations I've had. And starting from my first time, first time my knee was blown out when I fell through that floor in that house. And after every one, I was able to bounce back. It took me a while, but I did, you know, I did my rehab and stuff like that. And I was able to bounce back. So, you know, uh, five knee surgeries on the left until finally I uh, threw me out to the point I couldn't work in the fire service anymore. One on the right, uh, multiple, several others back surgeries because of the back problem. And, but I've always bounced back. I've always been able to bounce back. This illness that I had, this infection that I had, I am still only maybe 60 to 75% back to where I was before it, it hit me. And yeah. I was thinking, I said to my wife, my, my late dad had his first heart attack in, when he was 44 years old. And that was a marker, marker point for my older brother, who's five years older than me, and me. Uh, my younger brother was always sports minded. He was always out there and always in shape and, and doing things. And I said to her in the car, I said, you know, after dad came back the first time, and I was young, I was seven years old when he got back. I said, I never heard him complain about his, he worked hard. He was in his office for the, the supermarket company that he was a buyer for a big major supermarket company in New England. And he was in there probably by five o'clock every morning, came home five thirty, six o'clock at night. If he had some work to do at home, he'd finish it up and then he'd go lie down on the couch and usually would fall asleep. And he was exhausted. I couldn't blame him, but he never complained. He lived with this uh, heart condition for nearly 30 years. And not, I never heard him complain. The only thing he complained about was the first time when he couldn't get a haircut. He was in the hospital for two and a half weeks in those days. And he couldn't shave himself and he couldn't get a haircut. And my dad would, even though he was like me, bald all on top, he, he was very, he went every week to the same barbershop down the street from my home every week. And I said, I'm, I'm doing nothing but complaining that I'm not back to myself 100%. Uh, I still have this hypersensitivity to cold. Uh, it, what, what I call cold down here in Florida. I mean, it's a, a lot different than I grew up with in Boston or lived in Syracuse. But today it's totally different. And I'm wondering, what was the difference of my dad? He was a vet. He was in the Pacific, fought in the Pacific in World War II. And he just never complained about his physical condition. He did whatever he could do. And I said, why am I not like him? And my wife said, you really, you're more like him than you understand because your doubt is self-doubt. I see you getting better all the time. It's just that you're the one who says you're not feeling better. You're not, you're not doing well. And then when I read this and now what you just said, I understand. I really understand because I've been injured in the fire service and I got back. I went through rehab and I did what I had to do and I got back into it. But what you just said even hit me more powerfully because it is so very, very true of that's you have to look at the concept of its mind, body, and soul. And two of those are working really well for me. 
<laughs> I'm, just, I'm just pumping up the third, the third, the third leg just a little bit, but it makes so much sense, Gene. That's it. Really, as as I'm sitting here listening, it really made so much sense. And now, even more so, how I can see it, how important it is in not just a fire service. It's in, in any, definitely in our in our military and. We'd be remiss. We're we're taping this on the nineteenth. Uh, uh, Tomorrow will be the uh, inauguration. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank every single member of the National Guard in every single state in this country, and our police officers, and our federal uh, uh, law enforcement officers who are out all over fifty states across this country to make sure that not just Washington DC is safe, but that we're all safe where we are. And that is the resilience and the dedication of the men and women of these who are serving, serving us in these capacities today. And we need to thank them for, for their service. And hopefully everyone, Amen to that. Yeah, everyone is safe tomorrow. Them, us, every citizen, every uh, elected official is safe tomorrow because of their efforts to say, we're here. We're going to protect our country and our people. Right. You know, so, and that's resilience. Yeah. You know, it's cold. It's cold, real cold in some of the places where they're, and they have bivouacked in buildings and basements and, you know, it's not cots and beds. They're sleeping in hotels. They're bivouacked as, as would be the case. And um, it's, it's a sacrifice for them and their family. And we understand that. And we have to appreciate that fact because that's also part of their resilience that they will leave their job, leave their family to serve in the National Guard, whatever branch they're in, um, and be ready to serve this country. And that, mm -hmm. that is both the dedication, it shows leadership no matter what their rank is, and it does show that resilience. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I think you brought up a good point, Steve, which is um, something that um, has to get talked about, and, and uh, it, you know, it may not be comfortable for um, folks that are that are meeting this challenge in their career in the fire service. I know I've already seen some of it. Um, I'm um, I'm 37 now, so I'm definitely not uh, the same as I was when I was 21. <laughs> but but when we talk about resilience and if that really means growing something, the body, the mind, or the soul, um, there is an aspect that um, everybody will decline with their body at some point. So um, so. It's, it's not to say that you can always grow your body until you die uh, necessarily, because we know that some sort of decline happens naturally as we age. Um, and even your mind, to some degree, some folks will see some mental decline as they age. What's interesting, though, is that I think um, as long as um, you live it, it may be the case. I'm not sure, but I'd love to hear a, a rabbi or a pastor or imam talk about this. But I, I tend to think that your heart may not decline the way that your mind and your body does through through your entire life. That might be the one thing that can continue to grow until you die, um, interestingly enough. But uh, but yeah, so when we talk about resilience, we do have to take in the fact that, yes, there is decline from the human body perspective, which includes the brain, which would then include the mind. And there are sort of life cycles of where you peak out and where you begin to fall in performance. And, and that is a natural process of life. And so we have to take that into account. But um, going back to your point about the military, um, it's, what's interesting is when you think of our most elite forces in the military, the, the JSOC warriors, the, you know, the Navy SEALs, um, Army Delta, you know, Force Recon in the Marines, Parajumpers in the, in the uh, Air Force, those folks, um, they are put through harder and harder training sessions. And many people drop out. Mm -hmm. And the point of going through those harder and harder training sessions is to make them more resilient. It's, you know, it, it inoculates them with more and more stress. And the folks that can make it, make it. So what you're left with is the most resilient folks, at least in body and mind. I would assume, you know, soul comes along with that, too, because you have to deal with people from all walks of life that you've never dealt with before, all different races, religions, creed, whatever. And you have to work together as a team. So I would think it's all three aspects of it. But that's the whole point of, of military training is to get you from being, you know, um, I don't want to say couch potato, but somebody who's never been through these stressful situations 
And now for the Navy SEALs, they're rolling around in sand and freezing waters in Pacific Ocean doing mile long swims or three mile long swims or whatever. And before you know it, you're able to do way more than you were able to do before. You're able to overcome way more than you were able to overcome before. And I think that gets to the heart of what resilience really means. And we use it as a buzzword a lot of times. But when we say we need to increase firefighters' resilience, what we really are talking about is increasing the ability to overcome a challenge. And if nothing changes, then the ability to overcome a challenge doesn't change. And that's, that's where we, um, I think, need to start including that in the, uh, the discussions in the fire service about resilience, because we like to pound our fists on the table but when it comes to, you know, going out and hitting the gym or going on a run, you know, that's not as easy to do. Um, when it comes to reading something that we don't normally read, that's not easy to do. When it comes to loving somebody or forgiving somebody that we don't normally interact with, that's not easy to do. And if we're not challenging ourselves with those things, we're probably not going to affect an increase in resilience in ourselves or others. Right. We see that especially so. with uh, those of us who work in directly in fire rescue and EMS and, and, and police. I should include law enforcement as well because we see things that the normal citizen never has to see or would never want to see. And mm -hmm. we've dedicated ourselves to dealing with this. And that, that's, as you said, that's the challenge that we have to overcome. And I think every, every rookie in our, the, our three seg sections, every rookie is faced probably within that first year with that first, oh, I, you know, they're very big during training and in the academy or the, the department's training, okay. But the first time you have that exposure to a terribly traumatic and tragic situation, that's where you, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna use the term because we're talking, we, that's another discussion, behavioral health. But in my day, that, that was the day, that was when you had to suck it up. You had to, you were on the scene already. It wasn't, all you hear is about you going to an auto accident between two vehicles. All right, so I've been to auto accidents. What, how can this one be any different? And then you get one with a multiple fatality and you find out the other driver was DUI or DWI, whatever it is in your, your community. And you see the, the tragedy and the trauma of it. You know, it, you know, you really have to be with almost without feeling if you don't internally, you may not react externally, but if you don't internally have to gulp down that bile and say, oh my God, I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't expect this. But again, as you said, you take that breath and this is the challenge. This is that major challenge that you didn't see in the academy, you didn't see in any of the training, because they don't have that there. They have right. the, the, the crash test dummies, they have the uh, melange makeup we use. But the first one, when it's real, you have to either step up or step back. Mm -hmm. And when you step up and you do the job that has to be done, no matter how foul and tragic and traumatic it is, you've built another path of resilience for yourself. Right. And, and I think that's a great uh, point, Steve, and a, and a good segue to something that the fire department has been making an effort, uh, the fire service has been making an effort towards, which is, I think, um, teaching their new recruits early on, before they even get into the field, what support systems exist, and making sure that fire departments have those support systems in place. Because no matter how resilient you are, I mean, let's face it, Navy SEALs will still break an ankle, you know, they can still break a bone. Um, you know, they can still get PTSD if they're challenged with something that's so far beyond what they've ever expected to deal with. And, uh, you know, in terms of, and that's the mind, I guess, in terms of the soul, you know, betrayal is, is something that can get the best of anybody, right. you know? So there's always going to be a point, no matter how resilient we are in the body, the mind, or the soul, where we reach a breaking point. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that any human can get so resilient that they can never reach a breaking point. Then the question is, do you know how to get help so that you can overcome that challenge? Right. And that, that's a part of resilience. And that's a part of the mind is, is having the knowledge of what networks exist, what social support systems or physical support or system, uh, systems of the soul, you know, having, having somebody who can help you in a time of need where you've met your wall. 
that, that is a necessary uh, part of resilience. I, I would put that in the mind category. So that's the knowledge of knowing who you can reach out to uh, when you reach your wall to help you get over it or to help you get through it. Because eventually everybody will reach some sort of breaking point. Um, and, and if we don't have anybody to lean on or to go to, um, and, and to be fair, for those who are uh, very religious, sometimes that might be God, if that's who you go to lean on. But, you know, for physical breaks and injuries, uh, we do need to seek out the support of a, of a specialist who can get us through that time as well. So, um, so I would say that um, your, your point is very well taken, and, and, and your viewers uh, and listeners, I think, should, should realize that if your department doesn't have some sort of support system or a or a sister department near it that can help to bring support in times of need, then when somebody does reach that wall and they will, there's going to be a big gap to fill because they won't be able to get the help that they need. And, and so that's becoming a, ma a major issue in the, in the fire service right now. So, yeah, it, it, matter of fact, we, we have a PSA that we play in every uh, podcast um, on behavioral health and uh, encouraging uh, our listeners and viewers to uh, seek out a CISM or a, a MIMS or whatever they have in their community. Um, they can go to their, their religious leader. They can go to an officer. They can go to the chief and say, look, uh, that call last week, is, I, I can't sleep at night. I'm having nightmares. I got to talk to somebody about it. And, you know, that good, that chief or that officer will hopefully be there to direct you and, and help you or find find an avenue for you to follow because they value you if if you if you're doing the good work that we do they're going to value you and they're going to value that resilience you're trying to build you just got to remember you don't have to bang your head against the wall you can chip away a chip away at it slowly and you'll you'll get you get through it as long as you know you don't have to do it by yourself just chip 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 away and you'll see that light on the other side once you once you work at it and as you said and thankfully uh, over the last uh, you know probably five to eight years the fire service both from um, the IAFC SHS the division and NVFC and NFPA have all made inroads into behavioral health for for the mm -hmm. fire service and um, and we're, we're, we're pushing the same thing for both and law enforcement has been doing it for probably even longer than we have and, and EMS is picking it up as well. And that's important because that's part of who we are and we can't hide that part. We can't bury it. We're human. We're not robots. You know, thank God we're not robots yet. Uh, we may have parts in, you know, in, in ourselves that are uh, foreign bodies, but we're not robots. We, we can think, we can love, we have passion, we have dislike, but we know that uh, we're not perfect. And uh, we need to say, I have a, I have a problem and it's tough. You know, I've, I've been there and I know what, how tough it is to make that first phone call or make that first inquiry. Uh, I probably hung up, dial, I probably dialed that phone number 10 times, hanging up each time before I, I had the guts to let it ring and, and, and answer. Um, so uh, I think that I'm glad to hear that we're bringing behavioral health into the concept because I want our listeners and viewers to know that it's, it's natural that life is not perfect. You probably found that out before you ever joined the fire law enforcement or EMS group. You found out that life isn't perfect. When your fifth grade girlfriend went to, went to the dance with some, somebody else or the boy you liked uh, didn't like you. And, but you got over it. You talked to mom and dad or you talked to somebody else. Or you talked to your friends and how come he doesn't like me? Or whatever. But somehow you get over that little challenge and that makes you a little bit stronger for the next time. And then we build and we can grow and develop. And that's the thing. We have to be willing to develop and um, what's what I'm think of. Um, I don't want to say change, but I wanted to develop and understand as we transition from certain stages in our life to others that, as you said, um, we're all going to face certain challenges no matter what. You don't have to be a firefighter, a police officer, or a paramedic. We all face challenges in life. It's how we deal with them that defines our, our level of resilience. That's right. And I think you bring up a good point, uh, Steve, which is um, 
is that when we go through these challenges, we develop. And so that, that's a, a critical aspect of gaining re resilience, which is development. Um, again, we, we said this earlier, but if nothing changes, if we're the same person today as we are tomorrow, then we're not going to increase resilience just by osmosis. That's not how that works, at least in my opinion. Development has to happen. And so that, that begs the question then is, well, how does development happen? And uh, I think that um, in my experience, although uh, it's open for discussion, but I, I, would, I would offer that there's three main ways that development happens, at least with humans, which is uh, one is sort of a, what I like to jokingly call um, Darwinism, but, but I mean more like trial and error. Um, you, can, you can just try something, fail at it, and hopefully if you don't die or get majorly injured, you know, you learn what not to do, or maybe you learn the right way to do it. But the problem with that sort of Darwin, um, you know, trial and error system is that it can take a long time. Um, and if, if we're left to just trying and uh, failing at something, um, we're not going to necessarily learn the right way right, right away. But that is one way to do it. And, if, and in, in science experiments, we, you know, a lot of times what we can do is create a safe environment to do trial and error. And I think um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think that sometimes the best way to learn is by experiencing trial and error in a way that you can do it safely. Uh, there's another way, which is um, modeling somebody else or observing somebody else doing something the right way. We can do that, and then we copy what they do. Our, our development or our growth in that area may be a little less deep than if we tried and failed ourselves to find the right way but uh, we can get there quicker. If we see somebody doing something the right way and we follow what they're doing, we can, we can develop ourselves faster by just observing somebody. And then there's, I think, one last way, which is um, just transfer of ideas or transfer of knowledge. And um, that's maybe the shallowest way, or at least it risks being the shallowest way, just by like reading something or exchanging ideas. Um, but it's also the quickest way and it's the least restrictive in the sense that it's not bound by time or space. So you can read somebody's ideas from across the world and they've been dead for thousands of years. And, um, and, that, and you can still learn and develop from reading their ideas. And so I think those three ways are the three key areas of how to build resilience, which is either you got to try and, and fail until you learn the right way. Um, you can watch somebody else do it the right way and have them teach you, or you can, um, learn, educate yourself, or have somebody educate you on doing something better. And those are the keys to development in whether it's your body, your mind, or your soul. And that, that's what, that would be how we build resilience. And so what I'm saying is resilience really does hinge on new knowledge of something. If we don't learn how to make our bodies stronger, our minds better, or our souls love more or forgive more, then we can't build resilience. And so there's some sort of training or educational aspect, I think, to building resilience. That's, that's a great point. And I hope that our listeners and viewers will, will take that to heart to know that um, you, don't, you don't have to, you shouldn't and should not want to stay stagnant. Uh, yet you have to evolve. Um, and you can, you know, part of that is, is as you said, is all three, all three parts, because you can go to every training class that's offered in your vicinity and every national training conference you can go to. That doesn't mean that just by sitting there and watching them that you're going to go back to your, your department and you're going to know, you know how to do everything in every one of those classes that you've seen. Because you need to, if you didn't have a chance to put hands on or try it yourself and see were you successful, were you not successful, let's just say breaching the door the first time. Okay, well, they give you nothing and you have to do it with your hands to see if you can get through the door. You can't get through it. So then you have to choose a tool. All right. So most of us will, you know, probably go to a Halligan and maybe a pry bar. Uh, those who have a Nesta bar may want to try the new Nesta bar, but we're going to go use a tool in the same way that higher apes have learned to use a tool. We've probably all seen how, you know, a, a chimp, who wants termites will get a stick, put it in the mound, and then suck them up. That was, that's, that was the evolution of that ape learning to use the tool. So we have to use to learn, use, we have to learn to use our tools 
as well. And we have to do it in a manner that will have meaning to us to build that resilience. Maybe that first time we put that halogen in there and we try to put, punch that lock, it didn't work. Okay, doesn't mean you're a failure, doesn't mean you're a bad person. All it means is that that method that you used at that moment didn't work. So now hopefully your trainer, your officer is gonna say, all right, let's try this. Put the point right at the, in, the, in, the, in the key thing and you have the sledge, knock it. Boom, it goes right through, throws open, you breach the door, you're successful. Now you know, you've learned, oh, I can't do it just on the, using the leverage. I need to use power behind it to do it. Now I got it. It, 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 it. Nobody got hurt. You know, the world didn't stop spinning, but you learned a new skill that makes you a better firefighter and a be you have more information on the next call where you might have to do that. That's a great example, Steve. Yeah, so uh, I think it's, there's so much, this, this, we could probably do the entire podcast on just resilience, but um, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll hold off where we are right now because there's so much more to do on leadership as well. Um, but I, I, think, I think it was smart for us to start with resilience. I'm glad you started us there because the, if you don't have that resilience, that open mind to, to that, that attitude to be open to mind, a, a body and soul, then no matter what you learn, you're, you're either going to be, you either won't be able to do it or you'll be a, an automaton, but you're not going to be able to really, you need that resilience to be a leader because a leader gets turned down many, many times. Uh, right. Whether yes, you can command the people under you, but when you go to the people above you, and they you have this, I have this great idea, and let's do this. It'll be work out great, and the chief says, "No, I don't think so." But I uh, thanks. Maybe another time. You have to be able to take that disapproval and say, "All right, I gave it a try. Let's get on with life and move ahead to the next thing." And that's right. Yeah. So, all right. So, you know what? Let's so take should we transition to leadership? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say. So, let's take a quick, quick break. Let's take our first break here, and then when we come back, we're going to transition to leadership. And I wish I could just show you the pages how I marked them up with my, my highlighter that in the first eight pages of G's, uh, sec section of the dissertation that he, he shared with me. But you're going to be amazed by what you learn about leadership because I have never seen it. What these definitions the basic starting at the very very basic level in any of discussions that i've seen online or read in our trades uh, and this, learn, heard in discussions about the fire service so we'll be right back with my dear guest and returning guest dr gamali albert right after these words as always please stay tuned and welcome back to this episode of five alum task force i'm steve green your host with me is my returning guest uh, gamali albert uh, with an EDD, doctor in education, and he goes by the nickname G among his friends and family. And um, in our first segment, we talked about resilience and how important resilience is, especially for all of us, but especially if you are a leader or you're looking to become a leader or you even think you're a leader. And so we're going to talk about the very basics of leadership right now. So, G, if you please. Sure. And um, I think uh, to open up this, this section, Steve, I, I want to introduce an analogy, which is um, since we're talking about the fire service, that's our main, uh, you know, audience base here. Um, we know that there's a difference between a fire engine and a fire truck, even though both of those things are fire apparatus. Um, the real the reason we know that there's a difference is because a fire engine is defined by a certain set of necessary and sufficient components. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, we can start with some basics. A fire truck, a fire engine, I should say, has to have at least four wheels, right? Fire engines aren't motorcycles. They're, you know, they're built on a truck chassis. Um, it has to have, you know, lights, a siren. Um, and, uh, and it has to sit at least probably four people in modern days, you know, driver, officer, and maybe two firefighters. But Fire trucks meet all those requirements too, at least ladder trucks do, right? 
um, so far they would they would both be considered um, the same thing wheels lights sirens four seats um, but what makes a fire engine a fire engine is it has to have a water tank that meets a minimum amount of gallons i think nfpa says at least 500 gallons but most fire engines have 750 or more um, and ladder trucks don't have that that's one of the main differences a fire engine has hose usually multiple types of hose lines um, and then they have you know uh, tool areas or you know areas on the fire engine that you can carry extra tools hand tools sometimes they might have a ladder most of them have drafting hoses um, in case you need to draft but um, but there is a necessary and sufficient component list for what makes a fire engine and then that makes it identifiable from a ladder truck and so um, using that analogy I think it's important for us if we're going to be on the same page talking about leadership it's important to have a list of necessary and sufficient components for what leadership is because a lot of times just like resiliency leadership is a buzzword and and people use it for all types of different meanings sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. I think in the fire service, we like to refer to somebody who's in charge as a leader, or we like to refer to the people in headquarters that are making the decisions as leadership, the plural of the leaders in the department. But I think that when we use it in terms of um, whether or not somebody is leading, leadership means something very specific, at least to me it does. It doesn't just mean being in charge. Um, just like a fire engine and a ladder truck both have lights and sirens, um, a manager can do a lot of the things that we say leaders do. Um, and so the question then is, what is leading specifically? And I think you uh, you opened up um, reminding our the listeners about resilience. I think an important piece here is that a leader is um, – resilient themselves, but also building resilience in others. And, and I think the first step we have to take is realize that leading is different than management in the, in, the, in the way that leadership is bringing about some sort of change. Uh, whereas um, management normally is about keeping things the same. So day in and day out, um, if something needs to be done, that's a management task. It's making sure that task gets done. Uh, where leadership differs, I think, for the most part, is it's changing something for the better. But it has to be changed nonetheless. Um, and so that's the first component that I think is important to distinguish between what management and leadership is. Now, to be fair, managers can change something, um, but that's not what they do most of the time. And, and we'll get to where this diverges even further in, uh, in a few minutes. The next step is that... Um, Leading refers to human beings and managing can, uh, you can manage money, you can manage a process, uh, you can manage humans also, but I don't think anyone ever refers to leadership or means and, or they imply that leadership means you're leading some sort of money or things. Uh, leadership implies that you have followers. And so that implies some relationship to human beings. And as we mentioned earlier in the first um, part of, of this podcast, when we're talking about humans, we're talking about a body, a mind, and a soul. And so right off the bat, what we have is leaders need to affect some sort of change. They need to do something differently to a human. Um, and that involves a body, a mind, and a soul. And, um, and I think, to be fair, we should include in here that that should be towards some goal. Um, changing somebody for no reason uh, is is pointless. So, if um, if you're a leader, you're focusing on changing humans towards some goal um, for some purpose. And I think that um, what we have to include here as a necessary component is that we know that you can change somebody, and it can be towards a goal. It can be changing a human, but if that goal is nefarious or if it's bringing about a negative consequence, either for the person, the individual, or for society, um, we, don't, we don't like to refer to that as leadership. In fact, uh, in the fire service, I would, I would suggest that anytime we have, um, quote unquote, bad leadership, we oftentimes find ourselves stripping 
the title leader out of that phrase. Instead, we'll say a bad officer. Um, it's not often that I hear people talk about bad leaders um, because what I think we mean in the fire service when we say leadership is we're referring to something that should be positive. That's implied, but it's not always talked about. Um, and in the same way, just to go off on a small tangent here, almost every organization I've ever come across has some sort of leadership training. And um, it would be weird to think that leadership training is a neutral term. We're not training people to be either bad or good, right? We're training people to be good and to make a positive change. And so I think that has to be an explicit sort of check mark when we're looking at whether somebody is a leader or not. Did they change something towards a goal? Was it a change in humans for the, the body, the mind, or the soul? And was it a good, was it a positive change? Um, and that's the beginning of this definition. Um, but to be fair, oh, and I, I should add one last thing here. Um, in order to make a change, we talked about this with resilience. Another aspect of that is there has to be some sort of exchange of knowledge or some sort of development that we talked about. So whether that's uh, development through trial and error, whether it's development through ob observing somebody else or modeling somebody else's behavior, or whether that's development through being educated by somebody, um, there's a reduction in the knowledge gap that existed. Um, and so that has to be a part of this also. If, if you don't change somebody for the better, if you don't increase their knowledge, then, then we're not changing at all. We're just managing something. So up until this point in the definition, Steve, to be fair, a manager can do that. Um, it may not be often and it may not be all, um, you know, it may not happen all the time for managers, but they could do that. The main difference here, though, is that managers are doing something uh, based on rules and policy. It's, it's being forced upon you. In the, in the fire academy, if you don't do the, the PT, if you don't do the training, you will be kicked out of the academy. There's a rules-based system that's either uh, incentives or disincentives that keeps you on track. That's management. That's the science of management. It's a form of psychology, and what it says is, with a big enough carrot or a big enough stick, I can pretty much get you to do whatever I want. Um, the, the divergence here between management and leadership is that leadership requires this growth in a human towards a goal, uh, this positive growth, I should say, to be voluntary. Um, and that's the whole point of followership is that you're following somebody out of your own volition. Um, and so in management, it's not voluntary. You're bound by rules. If you don't follow the rules, you get punished. If you do follow the rules, you get a reward. But with leadership, all the reward and punishment is brought upon yourself as the follower. You're, you're choosing to stay engaged with the leader. And at any time, you can break it off. And so I think that's a necessary aspect of leadership, which is, is the relationship between the leader and the follower voluntary? If it's not voluntary, you're just directing them what to do, and they're doing it because they have to do it. That's not leadership. That's management. And in fact, I will just break off one more time here for um, another sort of a tangent. I think also that is the main difference that I see in um, communistic or socialistic societies versus liberal democracies. Liberal democracies operate with the system of voluntary law. We make the laws ourselves as a, as a populace, and we adopt those laws voluntarily. In, in a strict communist society or authoritarian society, those laws are put upon the people by the person in charge. There's no debate about it. In a liberal democracy, there's debate, a, a debate about what we want as a, as a population to follow. And I think that is the main reason um, why we refer to American leadership, quote unquote, um, for the world is because it's all voluntary, or at least we, we adopt these laws voluntarily. So I think that's an important point on leadership. The last thing though is how much time passed adopting those changes. So there's, a, there's something called the Hawthorne effect, which is this uh, observation that people will keep doing something that they think they should do if the person who 
told them to do it is still around. That's known as the Hawthorne effect. And so when you feel like someone's looking over your shoulder about whether you're doing the right thing or not, you're more likely to do it. And I think in order to know whether somebody truly led somebody else, we have to know whether they chose to adopt that change, even in the leader's absence. Um, so that would be the last thing about this definition is, is this change sticking? And um, are, is this person doing this thing, this new behavior, um, even though the leader is not around, whether they're dead, whether they've promoted, whether they've moved, uh, whether they're on the other side of the world, and that's the last, that's really the proof to know whether that person has voluntarily adopted the change. So uh, just to recap, I think leadership means making some sort of change towards a goal. It has to involve humans, so the body, the mind, the soul. Uh, it has to be a positive change. There has to be a reduction in a gap of knowledge in order for change to exist. And then it has to be a voluntary adoption of those changes, and it has to last after the leader is no longer there. And that, I think, is. Um, a, a, my offering of a definition of leadership that you can either use for yourself to know, hey, have I created any new leaders under me? Have I created any followers? Or to assess somebody above you. Hey, is, is my boss actually a leader? Have they done any of this to me? And I think once we have something like this that we can assess leadership, we can now talk about apples and apples comparisons if we're, if we're trying to have a, a discussion about leadership. And and I can actually compare my boss to your boss on an even playing field, just like I can compare my fire engine to your fire engine. And we know, are they both fire engines? Yes, because they have these components. Or no, because yours doesn't have a water tank. It doesn't matter if my engine's pink and your engine is blue. If it has all the necessary components, it's still a fire engine, right? Right. And, um, and, that, and that gets down to style. There's all different styles of leadership. You can be nice. You can be mean. That's that to me. That's like the color of paint on a fire engine. That doesn't really matter as much. That's very true. Uh, you know that debate goes on every day when uh, new new deliveries are posted on online or in the trades. Someone who painted that? Why would they have painted that that yellow? Wow! Oh, yeah. But that's that's option. That's choice. I don't think that's leadership. That's choice. Um, but I I love the way you compared the apparatus because. A lot of our brothers and sisters define themselves upon if they're assigned to an apparatus. They define themselves, that's what I am. I'm, I'm a nozzle jockey. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm the irons person on the ladder company. I'm the uh, collapse tech on the heavy rescue. They define themselves by that. But that doesn't mean that self-definition gives them leadership capabilities. It just means that's the apparatus they're assigned to and they work on, and they, for the most part, they probably like doing that, and that's good. That's fine. But I think by showing that the difference between the, the engine company and a ladder truck, um, and yes, we have to admit, yes, there are ladder trucks that do, we're not calling quince, real ladder trucks that do have some some water tanks, but most don't. Most are built and designed to be give everything that a ladder company needs, and that's that's fine. But we have to understand that applies to us as well as people. We we all have different traits, but a certain number of those traits have to come together for us to be firefighters. And to bring those together, we may not know on our own, but a leader, uh, the first leader that we have, whether it's in the academy or in the station, a volunteer station, and it's an officer, that leader is the one who's going to help you find those traits. If you don't already have them, create them and lead you to you put them into use in the job of being a firefighter. And that way you have that interaction that's positive. You're making a change. You're, you're, you're providing knowledge that somebody else is gaining that they can keep from experience and move on. That's what we're looking for in a leader. It's not the one who has the loudest voice. It's not the one who tells the funniest jokes that gets the most laughs in the day room. It's the person who can affect the next person in a positive manner, whether it's a new newcomer or just somebody in the firehouse or a, a true, you know, one of the platoons, how they can affect them to be, better firefighters and do the job that we do in a 
a better manner, in a new manner, in a changing manner, whatever, but you're imparting knowledge to them that they're receiving. And that's exactly what, right. And, you know, good leaders are, have to be good teachers. Sure. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's my 50 years of t teaching experience saying that. Um, when I started teaching, I was a lot more rough around the edges um, with especially the middle school age kids. Uh, little kids I was fine with and adults I'm, I was always fine with, but middle school kids were a challenge. And then I found that niche that I really liked about working with them because I could still mold them a little bit. And, you know, if, if I'm teaching them for the sixth, seventh or eighth grade, most of them getting ready for a bar bar mitzvah, just had one. I'm still able to mold them by not just telling them what to do and how to do it, but explaining why we do it and teaching them about the text and what it has to say and providing them a whole experience. We're, you know, for the last 20 years, Ruth and I have, besides just tutoring, those kids come in for hands-on. In other words, before COVID, uh, we'd start a new student off after a month working in the primer uh, with baking challah at our house. Nice. And, and then on Hanukkah, we'd make latkes. Uh, on, on Purim, we bake hamantashen with them. At Passover, we make chocolate covered matzah with them. It's hands on because that's part of the Jewish experience for them to learn to right. prepare for the bar about mitzvah. And so we both love doing that because that approach is just so much kinder and opens them up to say, oh, I hate sitting here. I have to give up, you know, an hour, an hour and a quarter every week just to sit here. Now they're saying, when are we going to do the, when are we going to make the latkes? When, when, when are we doing this? You give them that, that impetus and then you teach them about, it's not just making it, but why we make it. Not, the, not necessarily right. the how, but the whys behind it. And I think a good teacher, a good teacher is a good leader. Has well, I should That's say, right. has that leadership ability. Yes, and I and I think um, you bring up an excellent example, and 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 certainly we could convert that into a firehouse talk, and maybe we'll do that next. But to your point, I can imagine any one of these students, um, you know, one day saying, "Hey, I learned how to make challah bread because of you know um, my teacher." you know, Steve Green, whatever, whatever that uh, conversation is at the time, usually that's how it goes when they say, oh, I learned this, they remember who taught them that. And I think that's an example, that's an artifact of leadership. When somebody says, and that, and that goes back to the voluntary nature of continuing a behavior and keeping it in the leader's absence, is that that's the artifact of whether or not that leadership actually got, um, got complete completed i guess is that this person now can bake challah bread without you there and uh they're they're very likely to um cite you as the person who made that change in them and um and i think that's a uh that's something that we should um be able to to use in our own lives in the fire service is um when you're taught something you know going back to the idea that teachers are uh have the you know an angle at leadership, if they choose to use it, is somebody doing something after they've finished having the interaction with you? And are they continuing to do that? Now, to be fair, it is possible to teach somebody something, they've gained all this good knowledge, they've grown, they've developed, um, they, they made a positive change. And it is possible that along the way somewhere, they meet somebody who teaches them either the same thing or something similar that they, that they now adopt and they let go of the, the prior teaching. That's also possible. It doesn't mean that the first person was a leader or was not a leader and the second person was. They could both be leaders. But throughout our lives, there are gonna be times where we learn a better way to do something mm -hmm. and, it happens to, and it happens to change our behavior from what we adopted previously. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it does very much. And just to fill out what I, what I said to, uh, and it touches just what you said, is oftentimes uh, one of the students will say, we're getting near the end of the class and ready for the, the, the ceremony. And uh, they'll say, well, Mr. Green, will you be proud of me when I you know, do my bar, bar mitzvah? I said, yeah, I, I guess. I, you know, I said, I'm not so be proud, but I'm, I'll be glad you did it and you did it well. He goes, 
well, won't you be proud of me? I said, you know, I'll be proud of you. I said, if five years from now, through the grapevine, I hear that from your parents or a friend that Billy called home and asked mom to send him an electric menorah for Hanukkah because he can't, he's at college and he can't have candles, but he wants to be able to light the menorah for Hanukkah. I said, you do that? If I hear that, then I'm going to be really proud of you because then I see that you've, you've, ta- you've retained everything we talked about, most of what we talked about. And it's mean, it means something to you five years down the line when you right. be 19 years old that you learned when you were 12 or 13. And that, right. you know, that's, that, that's what work, you know, does it for me is that, and I've heard, I've heard it so many times. Uh, we have heard it so many times from parents or through the grapevine that, you know, this kid is doing this and this kid decide to, well, I'm changing, I'm taking some Jewish studies courses. Just to hear that is, is wonderful as, a, as an educator, right. that here they are in college and they've decided to take that. You know, I've, I've taught over a thousand kids since I, wow. 13 when I started. I, st- I was hired by my synagogue at the age 13, two months after my bar mitzvah for a dollar an hour to, to, to teach my, help tutor my, my classmates. And um, two, of, two, two of the kids have become rabbis. And wow. people said, only two? I said, only two? I said, I would have been happy just hearing one became a rabbi. I said, right. yeah, two, two is, to me is, is amazing. And I, I, I love the knowledge that I've been able to touch that many kids. And I don't even know how many adults over the years I've taught adult education with that. But, and now I'm, I'm still teaching. I have two, two different classes of adults. I'm teaching how to learn to read Torah. And they, they do well and they love the classes. And, uh, and to me, one Sunday morning, one's Monday nights, I look forward to, even as sick as I was last month, I still tried to make a, every class because it means so much to them, which means so much to me. Right. And because I know that they're, they're learning, they're learning the skill, they're learning the ability. I prepare all the paperwork and the audio files here for them. Uh, and to me, that's, that's, what I, that's the result I'm looking for, is not only am I teaching something, but they like what they're learning. And they make time out of their own busy lives because they're all adults, to spend time an hour with me once a week to learn and then the time they use to practice. And I think that, again, going back to a good teacher, if you can inspire your students, if you're a good leader, you can inspire those you teach, you lead, you, that they receive that inspiration from you. That's one of the most positive traits of being a good leader and a good teacher. That's right. And, and I, would, I would like to say, I think that's a great segue into um, a question that has, um, that's come up inside me. And I, and I know it's, it's, it's probably likely coming up in some of um, the listeners to your podcast and, and uh, your viewers is, um, let's go back to the fire service for a minute and, and talk specifically about the fire academy and whether or not uh, academy instructors are then leaders. And I think it's a really interesting situation because in the academy, you are under orders, you're under uh, rules, right? If you break a rule, you can get kicked out of the academy. You need to do what the instructor says. Now, just like we talked about, it is possible that a manager can create positive change in somebody. The question would be, was it voluntary? And did that person um, retain that change or that behavior when they've left that the leader, the quote unquote leader's absence. And so I think it brings up an interesting point, which is um, I know we've all observed this. Some people go, you know, you have a class of 20 people going through an academy and maybe 15 of them stop doing the behaviors that were essentially forced upon them in the academy when they leave. Right. And I think in that case, that's a great example of the fact that we know that for those 15 people, management science was occurring, right? They were being, they were being forced down a path 
that they didn't adopt. And it's, and it becomes obvious the minute they leave the academy because they no longer do those things. Now, it's possible that there's five people in the academy that continue to do those behaviors. Maybe they continue to do the exercise. They continue to read about the fire service, et cetera, et cetera. And you could argue that those five people voluntarily adopted what was given to them. And in those cases, leadership occurred. That's possible. I would, I would caution any situation where uh, force was used and the outcome became positive change to be um, – to be leadership because a lot of times when force is being used, it's management. It's, you're, you know, you're being directed to do something. But I think that's why if, if, if we can now take that person away from that situation and find out, are they voluntarily continuing to do this or not, then it's possible that you could argue that even though there were rules involved in that time in the academy, those people were essentially voluntarily adopting those rules and living by those rules. So in that sense, those rules weren't necessary for those five individuals because they would have done it voluntarily. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and I think, and that become that becomes very clear when, when we separate them from the Academy to find out if they're continuing to do that or not. Yeah. I think um, that, so that, that go sorry, ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think there's a, you pointed out, there's a very big difference between being told to do something and being taught how to do something. Mm -hmm. And you can be told to go clean the latrines because you're the probie. Okay. Right. Because here's your brush. Here's the disinfectant. Go in there. Okay. You didn't teach them anything. You just gave them an order right. to do this. Okay. But right. if you want to tell them, this is how we connect the LDH. On the right side, we're going to we're going to pull it. Let's pull it now, and we're going to show you how to hook up on that right side inlet for the LDH. And then you told them to do something, but the, it's a learning experience for them how to pull that line, where to connect it how to draw it out if they have to do a reverse hand lay. So yes, you're telling them, but they're learning from it as opposed to go clean the latrines. Mm -hmm. You told them something, they go do it, but there's nothing they learn from the experience. And they're not necessarily right. willingly doing it. They're doing it under the quote unquote duress of being the probie in, in the fire, right. you know. You know, and listen, we've all been probies. There's not a single firefighter who has never been a probie. Uh, one way or another, career, volunteer, wildland, doesn't make any difference. We've all been probies. And we've all taken the, taken the crap, and we've, but the vast majority of us have taken it and then grown with it and surpassed that level and continued to learn as we dedicated ourselves right. to our craft. And, and I think that right. you made that very, very, very clear. Uh, we, force and duress is not... Um, leadership right um, I, yeah I, I think i, I think good go ahead. no no i was just gonna say i think education is leadership that's right yeah and it and it um and it i'll say one thing about uh that and then we'll um i wanted to add something to the conversation but um you know it does bring up a question about our educational system for k-12 through versus you know um you know college or something like that um K through 12 is mandatory in the sense that if, if the kid doesn't go to class, you know, they, the parents can get in, in trouble for the kids skipping school. You know, there's a, a truancy laws and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is interesting because that means that um, there is some management duress being put on kids in the K through 12 system. When we go to learn after K through 12, 99 times out of 100, it's voluntary. We're choosing to continue our education by joining the fire service or by going to college or by joining the military or entering a trade. And I think um, that is an interesting divide. Uh, it's not to say that teachers can't be leaders in the K through 12 system. It would go back to that situation I mentioned with um, instructors in the fire academy where there are always going to be some folks in the classroom that listen to the teacher and adopt what they're teaching. But there are going to be those folks in class that are doing it only because they have to be there. Um, and that's an interesting uh, topic. But I did want to add to the conversation that, you know, I think if fire service departments, if fire departments are, are using this model of leadership um, for their promotional process, then I think it would increase the value of the folks that are promoting. And the reason I say that is because in my mind, um, a, 
a company officer should be able to develop the members of that company, the firefighters under that company officer. And that's true if you follow the logic that a station officer who has, let's say, two or three company officers under them should be able to develop those company officers. Same is true with a battalion. The battalion chiefs should be able to develop the station officers who then develop the company officers that then develop the firefighters. If promotions are done the right way, you'll get that. But I think they're not always done the right way. Sometimes people are promoted for various reasons and they don't have something to teach the folks that they're in charge of. And that's where you get these, um, you know, roadblocks in the system of the fire service or the military or every, any other organization where you put somebody in a position who doesn't deserve to be there because they can't teach something to the folks under them then they're stuck being a manager. At that point, the only thing you can do is tell people what to do. You certainly can't be leading them. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, it's true that humans have uh, human nature and we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And so there is a situation, there is a topic to talk about, which is, um, you know, humans can't always be expected to voluntarily do the right thing. And organizations, especially the fire service, are held to a certain standard by the public. They're going to be accountable for certain things that the organization does. And that's why it's necessary to have rules and policies. And in that sense, it's necessary to have a good management system. So what I like to say is that uh, management is what we rely on when leadership fails. And I think, to be fair, um, that's quite often because it's hard to be a leader. It's hard to get somebody to voluntarily accept a change uh, in their body, their mind, or their soul. Um, and that it's a rare thing to do that. I think leadership is actually way more rare than the way we talk about it, because the way I think it gets talked about in the fire service is that anybody who gets a bugle on their collar or multiple bugles is a leader. And anybody who you know is speaking on, like you said, Twitter or the internet is a leader. And I think if we use the standard about measuring and assessing what a leader might actually be, I think we would find that leadership is way more rare than, than people make it out to be. And that oftentimes we're looking at what's going on with management, which is what we rely on when leadership fails. So that's a key point. And, you know, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Steve Hurst, the chair chairman of the uh, National Volunteer Fire Council. And, you know, and that's I was in the volunteer fire service for eight years. Uh, one was very warm and very welcoming and nurturing. Uh, I had uh, one terrific mentor who voluntarily took my my buddy and, and me under his wing to teach us as much as he could. Um, and uh, whenever we were there when he was on duty, and even if he was off duty and wasn't working, he'd say, I'll meet you at the station and let's go over this. Uh, on the other hand, the other department I went to was not quite as welcoming and the officers there were voted on. So it was a popularity contest. Um, it was not qualifications or anything like that. It was simply, and that's a lot, but it's not every department, not every volunteer department. There are great volunteer departments out there. And I was part of one of them initially. Um, and I think uh, what you said is, is so very true. Just because you're, you get an officer's position doesn't make you a leader as you've defined in our conversation today and, and in your, and in your, your uh, dissertation. I think a leader has to be able to, as you said, I guess I'm just picking up from you, probably affect change and impart knowledge that people voluntarily want to accept and learn from. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm sure that in every, as you said, it's not just the fire service, it's, it's all three public service agencies in, in our military and other groups. Um, I, you know, I did nonprofit for well over 20 years. I did board leadership training seminars and led them ar ar around the country. Um, and there are people there who want to learn to be a good member of the board of directors and, and see what they, to help the organization. There were people there because they got the title of a member of the board or they were a big donor and they became an officer. And that happens. Okay, that's the life of nonprofits. But again, the same thing, and I'm sure we've all seen it on TV and in movies of managers, somebody gets appointed to be a manager of a, of a unit or a division, 
and he bosses he or she bosses people around. But those who work towards a goal of a promotion in a business, because they've they've attended seminars, they've learned, they put in the extra work, and they they're still hungry to do more. And at the same time, behind them, they're helping somebody came in after them, helping them get up to to snuff too. Those are the leaders. And that's the key difference is, like you said, there's a big difference between leadership and management. Mm -hmm. And we have to yeah, and I, open our eyes to see that. That's right. And, and I think for as an easy way to distinguish the two um, for, for folks that are listening is look at what people do when they're on the job and when they're not on the job. You know, when you're on the job, there's a lot of rules telling you how to behave. Does that person go home and behave differently? If so, that they're being, they're changing their behavior due to management. If they go home and they act the same way that they do on the job, then somebody led them because they've adopted some sort of way of living from somebody that they've, that they're bringing into themselves and they're doing it wherever they are. But, um, but that's an easy way to see is, you know, look at somebody when they're in the workplace and when they're not, because the workplace has rules that you have to live by. And if you don't, you get fired. And there's a lot of people who are not willing to lose their job. And so they'll act a certain way. When they're off the job, if they're, if they're completely different, then you know that, that they're living because of management. Um, and so that's, that's one, one sort of rule of thumb that I would um, give to folks to, to determine whether somebody's behavior is voluntary and, and being done sort of in the absence of, of whoever taught them. So. I think that's very true. And um, I think that hopefully, <clears throat> excuse me, hopefully that we have um, these definitions today and these examples we've provided, uh, they're easy enough for people to understand and they should be easy enough for people to accept as well. Um, the, the research you've done and uh, and provided on the last podcast and this one, and I think there's going to be at least a third one coming up uh, to continue this, that um, you're, you're actually, in, in my eyes, what I've seen now is you're, you are one of those leaders for us on this podcast. You are teaching, and hopefully our, those who listen or watch this are doing so voluntarily, and they're doing it to not, you know, we don't do much entertainment on this podcast, but we sure do a lot of teaching and learning. And so those who do follow the podcast or listen to it or, or watch us on, on YouTube, are there voluntarily to learn from each speaker. And that makes my right. guests, my guests, teachers and leaders in the industry, even if they're not an officer, they don't have to be an officer, they don't have to be a chief to be a teacher and a leader in that department and to impart knowledge of whether it's general knowledge like this or specific knowledge on this is how we're going to make an end. This is how we teach our teams to make their entries, uh, whether it's VEIS or VES or transitional or, or aggressive, whatever. That's fine. But they're teaching that and people listen to it because voluntarily to, to do so, to learn. And I think that's probably um, the definition that you provided today, definitions you provided today, uh, is going to help our listeners and viewers understand that difference in their own lives. Because the vast majority of our listeners are members of the fire service. We have fire buffs and other members too, and, and EMS members, which is wonderful. But what you've taught today is applies to all all these levels. Everything in public service is is governed by how you've taught today with the, the, the definition of leadership and resilience. Um, and I think that's, that's what we've needed. And, um, you know, this, if, the, if there's a way to condense this, so it could be an hour and a half or two hour presentation at one of the national conferences, um, I, I think would be absolutely amazing to, to fill a room with 300 firefighters of all levels and listen to the educational definitions of what it takes to be a leader and the difference between leadership and management. Because I think, Appreciate I think it's a cloudy, I think it's a cloudy sky, especially in the fire service. I think we automatically assume 
because this guy is a lieutenant or a cap, or this gal is a lieutenant or a captain, that they know everything up to that level and going to just welcome us and teach us that thing. But it doesn't always happen that way. And you find out, then you get disappointed. And when you get disappointed, you start turning away, turning off the audio a little bit. You're not listening as carefully as you would for something you were hungry, interested in learning about. You know, this captain specialized in, in high level rescue. Oh, I can't wait to, to learn about that and hear his, his or her stories and what they do. But if they just come in and say, all right, you guys go do this, pull that ladder and, and do that. That's, you're going to turn that prospective listener uh, or, or that member of the department off because you're not imparting the knowledge as a leader that your office, your level in the fire department really commands you to, to do is impart knowledge, teach, teach the people below you more skills and how to be better, better firefighters and what to do in this case. Right. Yeah. So, um, wow. I, I can't believe we've, we've gone an hour, hour and a half already <laughs> and, and barely touched what we want to get on today, but it's still so important um, because we've given for the, what I feel for the first time, at least on my podcast, a great foundation to what this is all about, leadership and resilience. And, and, and new definitions, uh, a clear review. And we're not out to, uh, we're not out to, to uh, say somebody's a fraud or, uh, in, in, in every educational endeavor, there are good teachers and there are not so good teachers. Uh, as I've always said, there are teachers who show up for the paycheck and teachers who want to teach kids or teach people. That's right. And that's true in every, in every industry, no mm -hmm. matter what the job is, there are always people who are there just to get the paycheck and then people who are there to really do the job to the best of their ability. And I think we've kind of been publicly shy to admit that in the fire service. We may, you know, after a meeting or we have our shift, we go over to the bar and we have a few drinks and say, gee, it's what, a, you know, what an a-hole that guy is or something like that. I can't believe he got us, that was all we did. He didn't, we didn't learn anything, but we do that privately away from there. But when that happens, that takes away from the experience. It takes away not only from the, the people who are trying to learn, but it takes away their the credibility of that leader who is supposed mm -hmm. to be their teacher. And if we do that, then we're risking losing people. When, we, when I talked with Steve Hurst two weeks ago, we talked about the first time I did this uh, show, a, 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 a panel, we talked about recruitment and retention. And as you and I talked on the phone, Chief Tony Correa, in, in Jersey said, Steve, it's gotta be retention and recruitment because if we can't keep the members that we have, how are we gonna attract new, new people to come in and stay with us? Right. And I said, wow, you're right, Tony, that, that makes sense. And Steve and I discussed the same thing, that it really does. If, because he even mentioned it in, in the podcast, he said, the best recruiters that we have are our members. Because they're the ones who bring in and say, some, hey, why don't you come to the meeting with me Tuesday night? See what this department's like. You might like this. This might be good. You might enjoy it. And we'd be at the same place. And he says, those are the people I need to keep because they're the ones who bring in the best new recruits that right. we, we do. And then that person, even if they're a basic firefighter, has become a small piece of a leader because they brought somebody new into the organization. And so- I think that um, hopefully this episode will help people see with a little clearer vision the difference between management and leadership. And I don't think there's anything wrong if done through politely and through the correct channels to ask about more lead, ask for more leadership if you if you don't feel that it's there it, that's missing in your experience. And um, be be don't be aggressive, but be um, 
interested in, ex in ex saying that, hey, I'd love to learn more. I'd, I'd like to learn more. Don't be afraid to say you want to learn more and you want to do more. You're not asking to be promoted to chief. You're just saying, I want somebody who's going to teach me more. Wh where can I get more knowledge? Where can I learn better about these tools? Where's another place there'll be right. more time? Things like that. So I, I don't want anybody to be afraid to, you know, to shy away from saying, I want to be a better student and learn more. And for that, I need good leaders to, to, to teach me. That's right. And I think, and what, what we can, what we can do, uh, Steve, if, um, if you'd like is, uh, in, in maybe another podcast in the future, we can talk about behavior change, which is at the core of leadership. Um, and then also talk about, uh, how you bring that out, um, to the next level, which is organizational leadership. Um, and, uh, and that way we can continue the discussion if you wanted to have, uh, have an, a longer version of this one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not if, it's just going to be the win when we put it on the calendar. That, that would be great. Okay. That would be great. I, I already great. wrote down those two topics. I think um, it would be, it's a natural progression from what we did in our first podcast, what we've discussed today. Because again, you laid this foundation out. This is now, you know, we, we've talked about this many times on the show and and in, even in my teachings, you need a foundation to start with. If you don't have a, yeah. you, you just can't put sticks in the ground and build a house. You have to right. create a foundation, do it correctly, and then you can build up from that. And I think what we did today is we took from our first podcast the the generalizations of, of the concept of of leadership and resilience a little bit, and your your dedication to bring better information and knowledge and, and, and strengthen the culture in the fire service through, through your studies and your dissertation. And now we can take that to, to the next one in the next podcast to behavioral change in organizational leadership. Because as we mentioned just a little bit today, we touched on it that, you know, without strong organizational leadership, you don't have a strong organization. Without strong right. organization, you don't have a cohesive unit that works together. And that learns. So I think those are going to be very important for the next time. Those are great. I do too. Jay, I, again, I can't thank you enough for your time and uh, your effort uh, in everything that you, you've, you share with us. And I'm looking forward to the, to the next podcast with you again, because I think our listeners and our viewers get a great deal of information from a podcast like this um, than, um, you know, yes, have I done some fluff? Sure I have. You know, to, to fill the air, airwaves. But I, I'm, I've been, the last year and a half or two, I've really been trying to focus on these, these key issues, uh, behavioral health, wellness, uh, leadership, um, to make our fire service, because whether you're active now or you're retired or disabled from the fire service, it's still part of who we are. And we all, for the most part, we all want to see a good, strong fire service career and volunteer in this department because we dedicated our lives to it. Literally, we right. dedicated our lives to it. So it's, I think anybody who has served still feels it's important. And there, are, you know, I've met some great people online through social media who are also retired out of the job or disabled out, and they still love the job. I mean, you know, I still self-define myself as a, as a firefighter, um, and they, we want the best for it because it reflects on all of us, you know, it's, that's right. you know, and that's, that's what's important. So um, again, my sincere thanks. And um, we will talk soon through email or phone and we will uh, schedule another one, hopefully in the next uh, month or so and based on your schedule and uh, we'll continue the discussion about leadership and resilience. And then we're going to add on uh, to it behavioral change and leadership uh, or organizational leadership and uh, right. the difference that it makes. All right, well, again, my thanks very much. Stay well, stay safe, and we'll talk soon. All right? Thanks for oh, having me, Steve. Appreciate always, it. Always a pleasure, G. Folks, we'll be right back right after these words. Please stay tuned. Hi, this is Steve. I just want to take a moment to remind you about our webinar coming up at the end of the month. We hope that you will join us on January 26, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. for our webinar, May Day, What Do I Do? Most of us have learned how to call a May Day, but few of us have been trained on what we are supposed to do 
if we're not involved in the May Day itself, and we're not on the RIT or RIC team. So our presenters will be Battalion Chief Andy Starnes of Insight Training, LLC, Battalion Chief John Dixon of In Instructor John Dixon, Captain Joe DeVito, Fort Myers Beach Fire Protection District, and Firefighter Nick Higgins of the Firehouse Tribune. Tickets are $20. They're available at Eventbrite, or you can use this short link to get there, which is bit, capital B-I-T, dot Lee, L-Y, forward slash Mayday in all capital letters in the number 2021. So Mayday 2021. And all the information is there, and the net proceeds will help go to benefit first responders in dire need. So again, we hope you'll join us. Wednesday, January 26th at 6.30 p.m. Mayday, what do I do? Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back very, very soon. Stay safe and stay well. Take care, everyone.